earlier we were talking about like, you know, I made the joke about being in jail more than anybody else. And you said you used to work in a prison. I want to hear that story. <laughs> it's not a crazy story. I don't really, care. But... I want to hear this story. Because here's the thing. I'm just trying to imagine Ryan for at any age working in a prison. Uh -huh. And I, I'm telling you, it is more comedy than it is like hard hitting drama. <laughs> yeah, it's not hard hitting drama at all. <laughs> Okay, so it was because <laughs> that's the best way to start a it's start not, a sentence. It's not nearly as exciting as you would think, but you also have to imagine not me as I currently am, but me with like little goatee and long hair. So like <laughs> curly hair and a ponytail makes it even better. Oh my gosh. Um so yeah, I worked I was how old was I? Sixteen or seventeen. I think probably seventeen. But so I technically worked outside of the prison gate in the warehouse. But I mean, we went into the prison to do like everything. So a medium, medium security women's prison. So it was like there were some serious, serious inmates in there. Got lots of whistles and... I'm sure you did. And yelling at me while I was going through there. Because I mean, even Proto Beard, I'm sure that was a real... Real nice beard you had. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we got, like, the the long curly ponytail, like, shaved mm. underneath. Yeah. Mm. That's, it, that's, it was hot. <laughs> what was this, like, 2008, 2010, sort of? Oh, no. It was, it would have been, like, probably 2000. That's right, because we're, like, the same age, right? Because I'm I, I turned 39 this year. Yes, so I will turn 41 this year. Okay. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. It's getting up there. But you know what? We've made it this far, and... Though, I mean, I've run the numbers. More likely not going to see. I'm, I'm, I'm at half-life this year or next year. Uh -huh. But uh, 40 is looking great. Like mm -hmm. 30, everyone was so worried about 30, but 30 was not that big a deal. Going from 27 to, like, 27, 20, 29 to 30, nothing changed, right? Because I was married. Yeah. I had a job. I was in, in a career and, and stable, right? And so 30 didn't, nothing changed. It felt great. And I don't, and I think the people who worried about thirty were the people who had lived their twenties in a very distinctive way, and had not like done some really important work. Still on hanging out with the high school kids, and <laughs> yeah, what was it? Fa it was and it's not Fast Times. I can't remember what movie it is, but anyway, yeah, um, that situation. Uh, thirty four, thirty five was weird. Not because I felt it was nice that I could run for president. Uh, I won't be in <laughs> at this least election. knowing you can do that. I, is... Yeah, knowing I could. <laughs> It w I think it was 34, 35 was the first time that I woke up and was like, oh, what is wrong with my back? Oh, I pull a muscle sleeping. Mm -hmm. uh, that was unexpected. Yeah. I'm sore because I went to tie my shoes too quick <laughs> this morning. Like I have to stretch before activities. That's, that is a thing that I think about. Yeah. And then I just have to stretch every day, right? Like I, Before I go to bed, one of the things I do is, you know, not yoga or anything like that, but I just, I would like to have some mobility into my 40s, so... You know, just some light stretching before I go to bed because it feels like that's probably good for me. <laughs> it's probably not. Got to eat thing. a salad at least once every other day. Mm -hmm. Probably every day. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Yeah. As long as salads have some like meat and cheese and that good stuff on it, it's okay. Weird thing about me, I don't put dressing in my salads. Oh. I like an undressed salad. That sounded worse than I meant it to. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, mm. I did talk, talk about taking things out of context, right? <laughs> My wife has this thing that she does not understand about me, and it's partially personality, partially probably ADD, but I'm an external processor. So a lot of times when I start a sentence, I don't know where it's going to end. And so we got to undress salad. But I do like a salad that has no dressing on it. Uh -huh. And it's a it's a difficult thing to explain at restaurants. You want salad? No. You sure you don't want ranch? Yeah, I definitely do not want ranch. <laughs> Just dry salad. I want lettuce and onions and whatever else. That's it. Okay. It's, I kind of wish I could do that. Because it's like, the dressing kind of gets me through. <laughs> No, I just, I've never been a dressing guy. So. Yeah. I, and I know that we're here because you really wanted to talk about my salad. It is. I've been wondering about your eating habits. Uh, well, and um, they're better than they were when I was 30. Mm. <laughs>
Well, so thank you for coming. First of all, thanks for Mr. John me. Bundick. And uh, I, I really wanted to talk to you about kind of a few different things around this whole idea of chaplaincy. Cool. So because it's, uh, I don't know. I feel like it's a thing that people know exists. Probably don't really know much of anything about what it entails. I, I would agree with that. Um, but I don't know. I guess, first of all, so you work a lot with um, the Columbus Police Department. Yeah, so I work with a local law enforcement agency. And um, uh, was volunteered as a law enforcement chaplain there for uh, four and a half years. And then recently was able to um, work, my, well, work my way into a, a full-time gig there. And so... My journey into chaplaincy started probably actually when I was in Martinsville. I had a mm-hmm. uh, deputy who was on the sheriff's department over in Morgan County. I'd ride with him. His, his daughter was one of my youth group students, and I'd ride with him every few months. And it was just a, I really enjoyed kind of just getting to see, see him do his job, hear the stories, that sort of thing. Uh, I grew up in a first responder house. My dad's a firefighter. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a combat vet and um, of uh, Operation Enduring Freedom. But growing up, I grew up at the firehouse, and the joke that my mom hates that I tell, because it's only like 30% a joke, but I learned how to swear at the firehouse uh, <laughs> up in German Township. It's and, funny how you remember where you first started doing that, because I definitely remember <laughs> right. on the school bus, like, older kids teaching me cuss words. Yeah, and- <laughs> it was, I experienced a lot of things at that firehouse uh, just growing up, and I, I want to say that part of my maturity or immaturity is, is due to the mm-hmm. <laughs> to that culture. And so had the opportunity um, to work with this agency uh, and have really enjoyed it. Uh, and chaplaincy, is, you're right, it's a weird thing. People know it exists, maybe. Mm-hmm. They don't know what it is. They think, uh, some people just assume like I'm a pastor to, to my officers, which is not what I am. Right, yeah. Uh, they know that I used to be a pastor mm-hmm. and for... Quite a, time, quite a bit of time that I was working with my officers and the other agencies in town, I, I was a pastor, but that I'm not their pastor. Yeah. Um, it's just that a lot of those skills translate over. And so uh, when we think about chaplaincy, right, it's uh, chaplaincy is agnostic, which is it has no particular religious faith. Yeah, and, some, and some people have no religious faith in their chaplains. So my, my, my orientation and responsibility to my officers, is I care about their wellness, I care about their mental health, uh, holistically, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what uh, I have behind me is about 15 years of student ministry and church ministry stuff. Uh, I had a weird hobby and interest in certain things dealing with, you know, psych and whatnot. I did, um, I did a tour with a the tour sounds worse than it was. I worked for a, a local behavioral health, a mental health clinic, and so brought that into it. And so all of these things put me in a place where I've got the ability to connect people with resources, uh, to hear a story, to compassionately listen and understand the trauma has some impact. I'm not a therapist. Uh, I haven't got my master's or anything like that. But being a safe person is a thing I learned how to do. Yeah. And uh, I think the best... Pastors are people who, before they're anything else, they are people that are safe to talk to. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't always great at it. I'm still maybe not great at it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I learned how to be available and to, to see people as having value. Yeah. Right? So that's, so that's what chaplaincy is, like in a nutshell, is being present and it's being willing to connect people with resources because I do have, I've got, you know, a list of therapists and mm-hmm. various other services that um, when officers, because they, they trust me, that I can say, let me introduce you to, or have you considered, or try this, and they're more willing to do those sorts of things. Yeah. So, that's so yeah, cool. I mean, that's the short version, which is still pretty long, what chaplaincy is. Well, yeah, but I mean, that helps me even because, again, you kind of assume like, oh, you're a pastor for the police department. What does that look like? <laughs> <laughs> Sunday morning sermons for the, for the whole crew and stuff like that. But no, no, I love that. So, I mean, you talked about those. I'm very interested in the ride-alongs and that kind of thing and like what those look like. Because that's crazy to me to even think that 
you can just go do that. I mean, I'm not everybody can just go do that, but right. um, so um, and one of the big things, and, and 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 we talked about this, but is like I don't speak for my agency mostly here because I, I get the yeah. not for profit situation, but yeah, I do ride with my officers quite often. Uh, so in this uh, transition into uh, vocational uh, chaplaincy, paid chaplaincy, whatever, uh, try to ride three or four times a week, mm-hmm. right? Don't always make that. There's a lot of paperwork and writing and, and things that I'm, I'm also doing. <laughs> but there is just so much happening in our town. Yeah. And one of the, the things that I, I like about what I do now is being able to connect people, whether it is, uh, you know, civic organizations or churches or individuals who are like, Hey, I just don't, I want to help. I want to make my community better, but I don't know where I can start. It's like, Oh, I've got five things off the top of my head mm-hmm. right now where either time, talent or resources can make a huge difference. Yeah. And, um, I like being able to see that. I like getting to see, uh, how we do policing in my community. Mm-hmm. Um, and cause in case you hadn't noticed, <laughs> I'm a bearded man and with, no, <laughs> <laughs> no I'm, um, you know, I got the all year tan rocking, uh, over uh-huh. here, and I think that had something to do with like the, like half hour worth of lighting. <laughs> just what it was. Yeah. <laughs> you were as pale as me when we started, but I was, it's but you know, affecting you. Yeah. This intense light. <laughs> And so it's a complicated thing, right? And yeah. I will like acknowledge that. Um, so I grew up in this community, and uh, I can say that at no point did I ever feel like my skin color or that I was targeted or anything like that by either one of the law enforcement agencies that primarily operate yeah. you know, in Bartholomew County. And I felt that way before I started working there. I continue to feel that way, but just being able to see what what is done in order to prevent becoming like a national story. Right. Yeah. Um, and to also see those moments of great compassion and care, uh, where officers do things to make people's lives better, who oftentimes I I think that the assumption would be like, Oh, they wouldn't care about that. Mm -hmm. And getting to hear those stories. Yeah. Um, also for my first two years of doing this, I almost every time I rode literally discovered a new part of Columbus that I didn't even know existed. <laughs> there were entire roads and like pieces of the town that I had lived here 18 years, gone off to college and was here every summer, then was like back and forth and then moved back. Entire swaths of the yeah. <laughs> city. I'm like, yeah. oh, hey, this exists. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, the way I discovered those was driving around with kids to get them to take a nap and just taking roads I've never taken before. (laughs) That's how I found some of those places. Oh, did you have kids that had trouble sleeping? Um, Not a lot, but sometimes it was easier to just like, you know what, we just got home, they just fell asleep in the car. I probably shouldn't take them out of the car no. seat. Let's go drive around for a while. Oh, yeah, I know that three-minute power nap is just enough to like get them enough energy to be angry Uh huh. and Uh cranky and not go back to sleep. But anyway, (laughs) sorry. No, I mean, because I took us off to kids, but back to that, like, I love, you just get to see, experience so much of the other side that a lot of people don't get to see. Um, And I guess that, that was one of the questions that I had was just um, in doing that. I know you've been doing it for a long time, so maybe it doesn't seem like a lot to you, but I just wondered how that's kind of made you view um, law enforcement in a different way. Um, Especially now, like we talked about, I mean, every, everything is my side or your side. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult a lot of times. And a lot of people aren't, don't try to see the other person's point of view, the other side of things, but just to be able to truly experience that, I feel like you can't help but empathize with, oh, wow, they're doing this and people don't really realize that or at least acknowledge it. One of the so just in the we'll start with the conversational piece, yeah. right? So again, I I fit into a pretty unique space. I think mm-hmm. in the Venn diagrams of John Bundick's life, there's, there's a lot of <laughs> unique circles. Going Lots of on. circles. And one of the things that I get to do is I get to have the conversations 
that sometimes people need to have, but they don't have a place to have them. And I, I mm-hmm. get to have those, uh, you know, sometimes with officers, sometimes with people who are uh, very, very conservative or people who are very, very progressive. Uh, one of the things I love about my Facebook feed is like when I put out like th- questions, everyone kind of knows the rules. Uh-huh. But they, I've got friends from all over the political spectrum uh, who will kind of engage and they're respectful. And, and that's the thing, like they disagree with each other and that sort of thing. But one of the big things that, I've been able to do is like walk through with my very progressive friends and say things like, Oh, so what you'd like to know, what you would like officers to know or think about is like the nature of power, the nature of racism, history of whatever, who are you having that conversation with? And you know, it's things like, well, I post it's like, yeah, but who, <laughs> yeah. like who are you having that conversation with? Like you are hearing back mm-hmm. and oftentimes the answer is no one. Yeah. Uh, when people are really honest and, you know, with my, you know, very conservative friends who are, uh, you know, no cop anywhere has ever done anything wrong, which I don't think anyone in a reasonable <laughs> mindset would actually ever say. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, walking through and thinking through, okay. So when we look at systems of, uh, systems of power, history, um, how we got to where we're at, it's not a straight line. It's complicated. Mm, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, getting to have sometimes in the middle of shift or in the middle of the night conversations about like, Hey, everyone thinks I'm a racist cause I'm a cop. Why is that? Because what yeah. you hear, I mean, what we, what social media does for us is it does, it finds us an echo chamber where we can be angry and where we can complain and all like the same thing. And I feel better about myself because I'm angry with other people about this thing. Mm-hmm. And I were rejoicing in victories and these sorts of things. But what that misses is the ability for someone to hear an honest sort of, oh, well, this is why. And yeah. then walking through and hearing the honest questions that are not, I'm trying to make a point, but like, I don't have anyone else to ask. Mm-hmm. And I think as I think about those kind of those three groups we just talked about, everyone has those questions and just being able to have those conversations. Um, one of the best examples in that law enforcement was years ago in youth ministry. It was in a small town, Hartford City, Indiana. No reason for anyone to know it. Uh, it's, <laughs> uh, it's in like the second smallest county in the state of Indiana. It's, I think right now, the oldest averaged age county in the state. Uh, they did try to secede from the Union during the Civil War. This is uh-huh. Hartford City. I was, by census, one of five black people inside of Hartford City, Indiana proper. There were only 7,500 people in the town. I think 15,000 people in the county back when I was living there. Yeah. And in my first few months, when my students, we were hanging out, and the students said, you know, hey, Bundick, I just want you to know, you're like really the first colored fellow I knew and like you're really cool and it's you're not what I thought you would, you know, you'd be like. Yeah. And I was like, you know, hey man, thanks for that. And we talked about it and just, you know, moving past stereotypes and these sorts of things. And then in that conversation, because I heard that student's heart, right? Mm-hmm. I heard what this student meant. I was able to say, and by the way, we don't say colored <laughs> <Yeah>. anymore. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. He goes, Aren't you? I go, I mean, aren't you? And it, and it was just like this light bulb. He's like, oh, I get. So what? I was like, safe bet is black or African-American. I, I've never been to Africa, so I say black. Yeah. That's that's how. But I mean, those two are the safe ones and those are good. It's like, because I, man, I hear you. And I, and I appreciate that this is a thing that you've been thoughtful about. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, these sorts of things. But I just don't want you to meet someone who's not going to be as gracious as quickly. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, but I, again, those conversations being in the context that we find ourselves in sometimes, and if we have put ourselves in places where we are not necessarily comfortable or not necessarily um, expected to be, you get to have really great conversations like that because this changed in at least a very small way how this young man thought and just the importance of language. Yeah. And... In his heart of hearts, he had learned something and he was excited to share that. Mm -hmm. He's excited to say, hey, you're not like TV. Part of which was I'm really terrible at basketball. (laughs) But being able to... (laughs) Stanley. Are you kidding me? (laughs) No, I am Stanley from the office. (laughs) uh, I think Stanley probably makes more than me, though. Um, (laughs) But being able to like talk through that and set him up for success 
after he left his com- like this community to go out in the world, yeah, and not having to have you know in college or uh, or at work or wherever you know he wound up. Actually, I know where he wound up, but we're not gonna put a pin on that for <laughs> um, that. Like his first like saying colored, and someone's like, "Well, now we're just gonna have to beat you," or like, "Yeah, you're such a racist." That could have been a much worse experience yeah. for him. Yeah. So I yeah. just think those those kinds of conversations are really important to be able to have, mm-hmm. and I like being able to have that. Um, and there's the ADD. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. So I, I mean, that's that's great, and I love that those like. I don't know, through youth ministry and through this, that you're having a lot of those conversations. I mean, you and I have had those conversations yeah. before, even part of a little short documentary that we yeah. did about some of the, some of those issues and everything. But I really do want to hear about, so you, you started, correct? Yeah, yeah I did. The Foundation for Law, Law Enforcement, Enforcement Chaplaincy. Chaplaincy. I got it. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, I wore uh, this. You can just read I it. I know, I'm reading it it's right It's like now. the teleprompter. <laughs> I'm, I'm wearing it. No, but so uh, just tell me kind of what made you what made you want to start that, and what's kind of the goal of of that? Yeah, so a few years ago, I realized that I was much better at being a chaplain than I was at uh, what I was doing in ministry at that point, mm. and it was the most fun I'd had. And I mean, the thing that the joke I make sometimes it's it's youth ministry with guns because one. <laughs> I, right now, I, I have I have some officers who were born after two thousand. Uh huh. So I feel super. Oh old. man, yeah, yep. And I mean, they're they're just <laughs> and to date myself a little bit more on this little excursus. Uh, <laughs> there's an episode of Friends when uh, oh Tom Selleck is like hanging out with. Joey and uh, Chandler, mm-hmm. and he thinks we're there. They're there as buddies, and they're like, "You're like our dad." Yes, <laughs> I had that moment two months ago. Uh, the guy's like, "Yeah, yeah, no, you're like a dad." I was like, "Well, I thought we were just hanging out as buddies." Mm-hmm. But like, no, you're that too. It's like, no, nope, it's too late. No, nope, it's, it's different now. I appreciate it, <laughs> but I know where I fit now. And thank you. Uh huh. It's like, <laughs> no, I will not buy you beer. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, youth ministry with guns, but it's super relational. Um, it's not just uh, showing up and saying, like, here are the things you need to know for your mental health or wellness or whatever. It is getting to know people, getting to know their stories and their families, which is what good student ministry is, right? Yeah. Anyway, so same, same kind of gig. And as I am uh, doing this, again with the ADD, um, <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, how we got to Fleck. Uh, I realized I really wanted to do this. Yeah. So I sat down uh, with uh, some of the, the leadership of my agency. I was like, hey, I'd like to see if we can make this a possibility. I'm like, sounds cool. We can't afford you. Mm-hmm. And there's just no budget for that. And, you know, basically, if we're going to spend money, it's, we've got three positions in front of that that we would even think about. Yeah. But totally get it. So start this journey. And one of the things I look, there's a chaplain up in Elkhart, Indiana, by the name of, uh, man, uh, Jim Bontrager. Mm -hmm. And Jim had started a not-for-profit in order to basically put himself into full-time chaplaincy. Oh, okay. I was like, okay, that's a thing I can do. Yeah. So start looking into that uh, process. I mean, you know, I'm working full-time, doing some other stuff. And then kind of accelerate the process going into uh, 2020. Uh, 2021 into 20 and started 21 and do the paperwork, all these kind of things and get a board together. And the original goal is to fundraise and grant right my way into chaplaincy. Uh, some other things work out and wind up getting uh, uh, some money from the, the city, find some money to be able to, mm. to make this happen. And so where that leaves us with Fleck is now we are fundraising and getting grants for to support chaplains and chaplaincy in Bartholomew County. Oh, okay. So how yeah. do we so how do we make sure that our law enforcement chaplains have what they need in order to be effective? Mm-hmm. So this looks like a couple different things. Um, one of the one of the ways one of the things we've been focusing on a lot recently has been how do we help chaplains improve wellness amongst officers? So coming up in April, uh, you know, 
uh, the organization applied for a grant and we got it from the Heritage Fund. They were so gracious in that. And it is to uh, help uh, underwrite basically what we're calling uh, law enforcement date night. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's just what we're doing is we're, it's, a, it's exactly what it is. It's going to be dinner. Uh, we've got some uh, catering coming in. We've got gourmet grazing boards coming in to do our charcuterie. And if you've not seen their Instagram, it is just beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, having been at a couple of their events, it's also delicious. And we're going to do trivia. And we're going to, you know, have a photo booth and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And also we've got a panel of experts coming in to talk about marriage and law enforcement, mm. uh, friendship, dating, uh, balance, how to like maintain over a career. We've got uh, a guy who I went to college with who's got his MDiv actually. He's coming in. He's like mid-career. He's been doing this for about 10, 10 or so years. Uh, another officer, she's been doing it for uh, 17 or so. Uh, and then actually my, my college roommate, who's a, <laughs> who's a therapist now because he was the smarter of the two of us. and But he's married to a... Uh, a nurse who was a flight nurse, uh, like for you know the helicopter flights. Oh, she did that for yeah. years, and so he's got this very unique perspective on being rem- married to someone who was out seeing these things. So mm-hmm. that's one of the things the agency, uh, I mean the the um, the organization is doing is funding that. Um, we're looking at trying to figure out how to underwrite a spouse academy for um, officers and deputies, their spouses. Uh, myself and Robert Vesser, who's the lead chaplain over it. Uh, the sheriff's office mm. are going to be uh, working on this uh, spouse academy, and basically, it's for law enforcement spouses. Uh, it's a pretty unique thing to live with someone who does any sort of first responder work. Yeah, uh, there's some very specific risks and things. Uh, so, one of the things we know, Sigma Tactical Institute. Um, Dr. Ben Stone is the one who founded that group. He's a retired Air Force doctor. But uh, who looks and sounds like Matthew McConaughey because he's from Texas. <laughs> and uh, I've gotten, I've, I mean, I've gotten a chance to do on the session. We've had some conversations, but you know, they've done research, and the average age of a first-time heart attack for someone in law enforcement is forty-five. Oh my gosh! The background population generally it's sixty-five years of age. Yeah. Uh, law enforcement officers are fifty-three percent more likely to die of a heart attack than people in the general population. Uh, they're um, these sorts of things. So we've got specific health concerns. When we, th- when we think about firefighters, firefighters are three times more likely to die of a heart attack than uh, people in the background population as well, I think is what the numbers from there uh, say. Um, we've got, depending on which study you look at, um, law enforcement officers will have somewhere between 180 and, 188 and, two, or eight, 188 and 800 Critical incidents. Now, a critical incident is where someone is fighting for their life. Mm. It is uh, executing violence. It's having violence executed against you. It is um, stumbling upon, um, you know, someone who's deceased. These sorts of things. Yeah. The average person, you and I, generally will have somewhere between one and three. Mm-hmm. So when you go for that, and it depends on agency size and these sorts of things. But when you think about the eight hundred number. If someone is in law enforcement for 20 years and they have 800 critical incidents, that is basically one every five weeks. And that comes with some very specific issues. Yeah. Um, they don't show up the same way. Not every officer is like this broken, crumpled mess. I think sometimes we do that with officers and firefighters and people in the military that they're all like PTSD and broken. And it's right. not that. It, yeah. I mean, it's not. It's They're individuals. Yeah. But there is this building up of things. And so how do we help them with that, um, they are, um, I think it's uh, two and a half times more likely to die by their own hand than by felonious assault uh, in law enforcement. And, and so one of the things that we want to do is we think through spouses living with people who have this specific, these specific job issues. And we haven't even hit on things like according to the Buffalo study that the average law enforcement officer who's a 20 year veteran will live on average 20 years less than anyone else in the background population. Wow. I think the national average for payouts for pensions is 18 pension payments after retirement. Um, and so that's a very unique set of circumstances. Mm-hmm. So how do spouses understand what's going on? How do we help in longevity of marriage? How do we uh, help people who are 
dating, engaged, or married to law enforcement officers to know like what their work is like, how to be helpful. Also, like, you know, things like I come home from work, the symphony of Velcro, which is the vest coming off, um, which my wife I'm sure is sick of hearing, uh, <laughs> happens. And then there's just like a slug in the chair. How do we, like, that's not okay. I mean, there's a physiological reason why that is happening. Yeah. But then how do we help people move into being, you know, the best person for their, you know, their families? Mm hmm. So we're looking at, so the, you know, Fleck is working on, on getting money and stuff together for that. Um, one of the things we're doing is uh, we run Patches, which is a uh, wellness station at my, uh, my agency. It's snacks. It's everything from like apples and oranges to like garbage candy, M&Ms and that kind of stuff, <laughs> coffee, uh, liquid death, which, uh, you know, you all Perfect. apparently. <laughs> uh-huh. And big, again, big well, you know, fan. Yeah. so if the people from Black Rifle or Liquid Death are, are listening right now, uh, we'll absolutely take as much free product as you'll send my way. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we'll take a to, small portion of that if you'll if you'll cut us in on that. Listen, deal, that's fine. Also, I feel like we could probably do some great commercials here <laughs> at uh, Run for Creative. Uh, but so that's who we work on that at. At yeah. the end of chaplaincy is trying to make sure that chaplains have access to funds to uh, help officers. And their families. Mm -hmm. Second thing is just making sure that we're equipping chaplains well. So, um, uh, one of the things that came up recently is that I am writing a lot more. So, um, my my board worked with uh, uh, to basically uh, it was an, a, a gift from an individual and from a church, uh, Oakville Christian. Uh, so those two gifts basically got me uh, two ballistic vests and one with rifle plates. Because mm -hmm. uh, again, we're just seeing an increase, just even as Officers are sometimes sitting doing paperwork and that sort of thing, being ambushed and shot in their cars. Wow. Um, yeah. You, I mean, if you. So, yeah. So, and yeah. again, I'm in a car and, you know, chaplain looks like captain if you're not really paying attention and these sorts of things. Uh huh. And so there's like, you know, the real risk of that. And so, yeah, I like going home and. It's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So making sure that chaplains have what they need and, and that includes trying to figure out how we can do. Uh, provide training or bring training or send chaplains to training and working with agencies to make that happen. Yeah. So. And that's awesome. I love that you're, you're kind of going from the little day to day. Here's a snack as you go out the door all the way up to those, those bigger issues. So before we go anywhere else talking about that, if I want to donate, yeah, I assume Financial gifts are great. I don't know if there's anything else that you're typically <laughs> looking for, but how, do, how does somebody do that? So we've got all sorts of ways okay. uh, to, to connect. And, um, you know, the link that's appeared somewhere magically on the screen. Uh, we've got a link I'm sure it will. <laughs> yeah. Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? Uh, uh. But we've got a link tree, and there uh, you'll see, like, partner with us financially, which okay. is... Uh, you can donate financially, you know, five dollars to five thousand dollars, whatever works. And with that, it is we are a an IRS uh, approved uh, not for profit five hundred one c three, and so that is tax deductible. So that's one option. Yeah. Uh, another option is I do have on that same link tree. We've got um, for uh, this wellness station we called Patches, an Amazon and um, Walmart wish list. So oh, okay. You're like, hey. Uh, cause if you're like me, like money's great, but I also like, I like to like send a thing like, yeah, buy, I mean, that's, you know, it's the, it's, it, I think it's a pretty human thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's a difference like on Christmas giving a gift card or actually buying somebody right. something like and it feels different. So yeah. if you want to go and, you know, buy stuff for the fridge or buy uh, coffee or the snacks that my, my offices are eating and that sort of thing, uh, year round, we will take those. We have, yeah individuals and organizations who um, sponsor. We have got monthly sponsorships for that. We ask for you know, an organization to get the sponsorship for to ha for 500 to $750, um, which is roughly five to seven and a half dollars per person in the agency. Um, and that generally fills um, the snack needs. Uh, mm -hmm. But if we've got any sort of training or if there's any sort of incident where we've got people just on station a lot, which is a pretty regular thing. Um, we run out, we can run out of snacks pretty quick. So it's helpful just <laughs> to have sure. this like 
stash of things that I'm able to fill that with. So there's that. Um, and so those are like the three big ways yeah. in, uh, in helping out. Uh, if you're looking financially or looking to just like give practically, I know some people like specifically just want to make sure that cops have snacks and that sort of thing. And I love that. And, um, so if it's like the Amazon wish list, uh, that's great. Or if it's just like, you know what, what do you need in order to keep chaplains going well to continue to equip chaplains in the County and, and make sure those things are happening. Um, again, the, that partner with us link is going to be a great way to do that. And so, um, yeah, both of those are, or all three of those are really helpful. And if you happen to work for a company or as an individual, like I've got $750 just lying around, I would love to sponsor a month of this, this wellness station. Mm, yeah. Um, I will absolutely know, let you know what month you can have. You can just reach out because <laughs> my contact information is in there as well. So, okay. Yeah. Awesome. So we'll close it at that, but is there anything that you want to leave people with? I'm honestly kind of thinking, obviously donating, financially or anything like that to FFLEC is yeah. awesome. Um, I'm wondering if there's something you would say to people to keep in mind what's something they can do or even just maybe a perspective they can have when interacting with officers. Yeah, I think one of the things I'd say is that everybody's got a story and everybody's a person. And when we think about law enforcement, whether you have some particular hesitancies mm -hmm. or you're all in, whatever it is, um, we ask a lot of people who are first responders, whether they're cops or firefighters or EMTs, um, even dispatchers. Like we ask a lot of them. We ask them to see things and hear things and do things, experience things, smell things, so that we, as the rest of polite society, don't have to mm. acknowledge for most of us that this exists. Yeah. And so when we are looking at your local community and you've got questions, um, law enforcement is an extension of government, which means that you absolutely can and should ask questions. How we ask questions is really important as people. Mm -hmm. And to approach this first and foremost out of realizing that the person who answered the phone, the person who's going to answer that email, the person you're going to be looking at is a human being with a story. Yeah. And you are probably not the first person to be awful to them that day. <laughs> so I'd start there. The other thing I'd say is if you have a first responder in your circle, uh, you may be tempted sometimes to ask, what's the weirdest or worst thing? Uh huh. Don't ask that question. Uh, for lots of reasons. One, you don't want the actual answer. Because yeah. I would give you an actual answer to mine, mm. which is, I don't think, I think you'd probably have to put some sort of like NSFW situation in front of this <laughs> podcast. Um, so you don't actually want that answer. And if you do, I've got questions. Um, but then the follow-up to that is, again, they're people. And it's not fun to dig around in someone else's, uh, for lack of a better term, trauma. Yeah. For your voyeuristic sort of pleasure. And people will talk about the things they want to talk about when they're ready to. Um, and I guess the third thing I'd, in, I'd leave is the national conversation and the local conversation are not always the same. Mm. And so as we have a national conversation about what are our goals in law enforcement, who's writing laws and why, and what laws do we want to have as a nation and what do I want to do around um, the number of people that we imprison and, and for what and what is happening in other communities? That is an important conversation. It may not necessarily be your conversation in rural Indiana or mm -hmm. um, suburban Maryland or wherever you may find yourself. And so being able to understand that what is happening on the national news may or may not be what's happening in my local community. Yeah. And so as I think about asking those questions or interacting or engaging or wanting to prevent from being one of those communities that I've heard so much about where law enforcement's gone poorly, how do we do that in a way that is like constructive and recognizing that most people that I have met that do this job, both here and other places, um, got into it for one of two reasons. 
either they're justice oriented, which means they want to make things right for people for for people that have been wronged, mm -hmm. or they are very compassion oriented, and they are helpers by nature. Um, and so, how do we have a conversation well with them? Yeah. So, yeah, I think those will be the things I would I would I would leave you with. That's great. So, yeah. I love it. Well, seriously, thank you for being here. I know we could probably talk all day. Uh, I think we could, but I mean, beards this fine together in the same room with death wish and, <laughs> death wish and mug. It doesn't happen very often. It's, uh, it's an invitation <laughs> to just solve all the world's problems, really. Awesome, man. Well, thank you. Well, thanks so much. Thank you.